So it's one o'clock and I don't want to uh, waste uh, too much of your precious time. Uh, thank you for finding the time for attending uh, a webinar uh, presented by me. Uh, maybe some of you already attended some webinars from me in the past. Um, I'm uh, explaining a lot about the possibilities of the ultrasonic technology. And for today, I want to explain a little more about uh, lubrication. And it's not just lubrication, it's online precision lubrication. So it's a nice tool, nice technology, what makes lubrication easier and faster to do. So online precision lubrication, the future is now. Eh, like the title states, the future. The future, well, we are all thinking about new technologies, finding easier methods, more effective methods um, for all different kinds of applications. And in this situation, it's about lubrication. So what can we do? What technologies can we use to make lubrication more easy? So before we start, just a short introduction about who am I? Uh, my name is Peter. I think lots of people already know me. Um, I'm uh, more than 12 and a half years now at UE Systems. Um, Travel the world, seen, well, almost every industrial environment, met a lot of different people, different cultures, different maintenance technologies. Um, and at this moment, I am fulfilling the role of yeah, well, product manager, uh, international product specialist. So I'm really involved in product development, product improvement. And for now, I want to talk about the online system. So we're an American company based in New York, um, founded 1973. And uh, well, we use ultrasound and this technology is being used for predictive maintenance, um, but also energy conservation. The presentation what I'm going to talk about now is focused on predictive maintenance. Okay, so uh, let's jump start immediately. Lubrication. Uh, that's what this presentation is all about. Lubrication. Lubrication, your bearings. Uh, well said. And when you think about lubrication, <clears throat> why is it so important? Or uh, maybe you never thought about it, but what is the role or what is the function of lubricant, right? So lubricants do much more than just make things slippery. What is a lubricant? Well, a lubricant is a substance applied between two surfaces in motion to reduce friction and wear over time. Without these substances at our disposal, modern machinery will break down. So a lubricant has what we read here, the function, a very important function to reduce friction. Yeah, rub your hands for a long time and it will become very hot. Or if you put some oil in there or lotion, it will not get that hot. So it reduces friction. And of course, wear over time. Because if we optimize the friction level, so we minimize that, the wear of the bearing will go down and it will happen very slowly. So it doesn't go very fast. Okay. so. The primary functions of a lubricant, uh, just, just to stand still a little, to think about it. Because for most of the people, lubrication is, all right, grease gun, here we go. But there's way more knowledge needed behind it to optimize your lubrication. So first of all, reduce friction. What will prevent wear? Protect the equipment from corrosion. Control temperature, uh, because you reduce friction. Control contamination, so be sure there's no contamination in there. Transmit power, hydraulics, that's something else, but of course, to provide a fluid seal. And the most important thing is that the fluid seal in there is not too thick and not too thin. We need to optimize it, but how can we do that? Okay, so the history, when we look very far to the, to the beginning of lubrication, because it already exists, uh, Humanity, mankind already exists for a long time, but the first signs of lubrication, and don't think about rolling element lubrication, no, was around 3500 BC. Dragging big trees without their bark, so the skin of the tree and the juice from the tree, that functioned as some kind of lubricant so that it was easier to drag the big logs over the ground. 
Then you see more 2,600. There was some more lubricant uh, made of uh, human uh, grease fat and eventually Leonardo da Vinci and the 16th century. And of course, the closer we are to the moment we are now, the modern day, of course, the more modernized the greases, the more types, um, but it's still the same. We want to reduce friction to prevent wear. So lubricant is important. So basically, uh, with this short introduction, simple conclusion, if it moves, it needs to be lubricated. And this presentation is, of course, not about the right picture you see, but on the left picture. And you all have bearings in your facility. Big ones, small ones, high speed, low speed, heavy load, uh, roller bearings, needle bearings, uh, all different types of bearings. But the conclusion is, basically, it doesn't matter how we're going to grease the bearings, but we need to grease the bearings, and we need to do it with the right quantity, quality, uh, the, the time in between to grease it. So it's very important. So the question we have at the moment is, we now know, we understand that we need to grease bearings, but how are we going to do it? When you look in your facility, how do your lubrication engineers grease the bearings, right? A very common one that's being used, and I will call it option one, is the handheld units. Uh, you can do it manually or the picture you see in the middle uh, with a battery powered. So that means you just push the button and it starts to, 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 to grease bearings. But there is a lubrication engineer that maybe lubricates the bearings based on experience. So there's no plan at all. Uh, go with the flow, grease this bearing a little, grease that bearing a little. But of course, that's a tricky side because does that specific bearing really need grease at that moment? Another step what you can do with here is time-based. And time-based means you have a schedule that says after so many running hours, we need to add so much grease in this specific bearing. So you can do that with these things. But the danger is you can still have some kind of contamination. Is the, the nozzle clean? Uh, or uh, is the correct type of grease in the grease gun uh, that matches the grease in the bearing housing? So there are still some tricky parts that eventually can break down your bearing a little sooner than expected. Another option what you can do, and that's also what you see a lot in the factories, is with single point lubricators. So that is just a single point lubricator that can be pressurized by a spring or uh, time-based by a, a battery that you can program that says every so many hours, we need to add so much grease. But the danger is if the asset is not running all the time, so it stops or it is redundant yeah, that it rotates for a month and then his little brother takes over and that one is stopped for a month. And if you have those lubricators on there, eventually what, you can uh, what, what can happen, and that's also what you see on the picture, the grease is literally pouring out of the seal. What means the bearing is over greased. There's too much grease in the bearing. And maybe you think at the beginning, yeah, but more grease is better. No, it's not, because if you put too much grease in the bearing and the grease cannot go anywhere, you build a high pressure in there. High pressure, higher temperatures, maybe the grease will immediately go out or you get a nice extra layer on the outer race. What will cause is more friction, more friction, more heat, and eventually your bearing will fail. So over lubrication is an absolutely a no-go. One moment, what I just want to say, I forgot to say that with my intro. That's also because uh, my last webinar, I think, was six months ago. Uh, there is a Q&A in the top. Um, I will not answer the questions during my webinar because there are too many people attending and that will take too much time. But just ask a question in the Q&A. And after the webinar is closed, I will personally answer each question that you ask me with a personal email or maybe a phone call if that's easier. So don't hesitate. If you have a question, feel free to put it in the Q&A here, and then I will come back to you as soon as possible. Okay, so 
that was a little thing what I uh, what I wanted to say. All right, so what you see here, option three, you see the handheld gun again, and it can also be an automated grease gun, but there's something attached to it. That's called a grease caddy. And the grease caddy is a nice next step to optimize your time-based lubrication program, because you know what bearings you need to grease in this time period. But instead of just following the guidelines, we're now going to listen during lubrication. So if you need to grease bearing A and you lubricate and you hear the sound level going down because the friction level is going down because you're optimizing the friction level with the amount of grease. And eventually the moment is there that it stops reducing in sound and stays stable. That's the moment you need to stop greasing the bearings. You optimize the friction level. So you have a better understanding in what you're doing during lubrication. But the danger is in here, do we have the correct type of grease in this grease gun? Is it the same grease as what's in the bearing? And the last one, and that's also what I want to talk about, that's option four. It's condition-based. And the way this system works, and I will talk about it a little later, is it does online monitoring. It just monitors the friction level. And what you can see in the screen, you see 34.4. That's a current decibel. It has lubricators, it has sensors, and the power with this system is the combination. Online monitoring is not new. Online lubrication is something what is new. And it is not only to grease the bearing, but because we have the sensors on there that check the friction level, we remotely basically can see how much grease needs to be put into that bearing. And that's very simple uh, described, but that's the principle from the system. It's an online lubrication system. It's called the Entra. Okay, so now we know the four options. And when you see the system, that does not automatically mean that all bearings need the system. Right? It's the combination of the four options I showed you. But if you have critical assets or hard to reach assets, or you just don't have the capacity, the manpower to grease the bearings on a correct way, this could be helpful. Okay, <clears throat> so when we look at the curve, the whenever lubrication, that means I don't have a plan, I have a grease gun, but I'm not really sure, but I just grease the bearings and I hope for the best. Of course, that's not from this time anymore. The other two, what will happen a lot of us, of course, is right, time-based. There's a grease plan in the factory, so you know which bearings you need to grease and how much. But when you want to fine tune that, then you can use a grease caddy to listen to the effect of what you're doing. Another thing what you also can do, and that works very good with assets that rotate with a certain speed on a certain load, and to do automated lubrication. So time-based. And step five, that is of course the system, uh, what can make life easier if you have some critical assets that need these kinds of help. So up to 80% of premature bearing failures can be traced down with problems or with lubrication. And that is from the bearings that fail. Eh? So if you have a lubricated related bearing and we would investigate why it would fail, that approximately till 80% can be traced down by improper lubrication. And improper lubrication is a very wide description. It's not only too much grease or not enough grease, but can also be the type of grease. And contamination, uh, how did we store the grease? And sometimes you see like those big grease cans and they're outside and there's water on there and there's uh, high humidity. So you have water in your grease. So everything what is related to grease can eventually heads up to the failure of bearings. And when you look at it very close, it's all human factors. So if we do a little more training, and that's why I say lubrication is, is a specialism. It's not what you just ask somebody on the street, like, hey, here you have a grease gun and here you can grease some bearings. No, you need to know what you're doing. Okay, so how does it work? Well, first of all, with ultrasound, we measure friction. It's just a sensor with a piezoelectric crystal in there. 
And when the bearing runs, it creates friction. And basically what we want to do, we want to monitor the friction to see if the friction level is slowly going up, what's related to lack of lubrication. So the lubrication level is going down slowly in the bearing. We need to find that moment when the bearing really need to be greased. And that's what we do with the sensors. We measure the friction level. And that makes it very simple to understand, but very effective. All right, so when we measure the bearings, we know when grease is required, because if we see that the friction level goes up, this is the moment we need to do something. But when we're listening with the sensors or a handheld unit during lubrication, we also know how much grease is required because we monitor the friction level. And you see here a curve, time on the bottom, friction level, so amplitude on the side. When we find the bearing at the right moment and we grease at the right moment with the right amount, it literally goes back to the baseline because we found it on time. Of course, the longer we wait, eventually you already get some microscopic damage in the bearing. And of course, if you grease, you will notice a drop in friction, but it's not the same health as it was when we installed the bearing. So find it on time. Okay. You see here some, well, let's say action levels. We are uh, in accordance with the ISO. And in those ISO are stated that when we establish a baseline, that plus ADB, so it's a delta value, represents lack of lubrication. So that would be our moment to grease the bearing. Plus 16 decibel would mean beginning of visual faults. So if we would take the bearing out and I would look really close to it, maybe you see some beginning of visual faults. Is that a reason to panic? No, but it's a trigger that the bearing will not be healthy anymore, even if we would grease the bearing. And if it's plus 35 decibels above the baseline, yeah, that's the sign for us that, well, we need to absolutely replace the bearing on a short time notice. So somewhere between the plus 16 dB and plus 35 dB, depending on criticality, uh, you need to come up with a plan when you want to replace this type of bearing. But the advantage is that you are in the advantage that you know that this bearing needs need some kind of attention or needs to be replaced. So you can order the bearings, you can put it in your planning. When do we have a stop? So you can take that bearing and it doesn't cost too much time to replace it. And you want to prevent unplanned, unplanned downtime. Okay, so when we have the lubricators, you see them here in the picture, um, they're digital and they're pretty smart. It's not that they're super intelligent, but they're pretty smart. So what we can do is the data that we have goes into the cloud. And in the cloud, we can see how much grease is still in every single lubricator that we have in the field. And because it's web-based and in the cloud, it doesn't matter where I am, I can even check it from my holiday eh, location. I can see exactly how much grease is in there. You even get an email that says, hey, there's 25% grease left in the lubricator. Maybe you need to order already a new service pack so that you're on time to replace the grease. That it is not empty. So even when you're not around, you can still see there is something going on or we need to order some grease in advantage. Okay, so here you see a computer, it's open and this is just an example, but this is how it could look like. QE Insights, it's the cloud-based platform, um, web-based. That means every mobile device or that has internet and a browser, you can check your assets. You can check it on your phone, you can check it on your tablet, doesn't matter. And what you see here in a simple overview, and I will explain it shortly, you see a trend. Yeah, the blue dots, those are one minute measurements. And that's the decibel. On the bottom, that's the time. So eventually you see, hey, the friction level is, is rising. In that case, what you see here, we lubricate it eventually, and you see that it's back on the green line. It's the baseline. So with this dashboard, you have different types of widgets that provides different types of information. 
and it is modular. That means I can build the dashboard for you in any which way you prefer. If you only want to see decibel levels from 80 assets and that the decibel needs to change color to determine what kind of alarm level it is, it's possible. If you want to see a needle indicator, it's possible. Historical trend, possible. Um, how much grease is still in there, possible. So you can build it in any way you want. Okay, so regarding the data transfer, you know, what you see, the on-track box, it has the capacity to mount 16 sensors. So basically every on-track box can monitor 16 sensors, but you can also mount 16 lubricators if needed. And the way it transfers the data can go by three ways. Or you have factory Wi-Fi. It's not very common, but it can happen eh, that you have a Wi-Fi network in the factory. So you can have an on-track that you can connect by Wi-Fi. Uh, the ones I see a lot is by Ethernet. Or if you don't have an option to get it connected by Ethernet or you want to start a pilot, uh, but to have a quick connection, you can do it by cellular. It's an eSIM built in there. And then it goes by the IoT network to transfer the data on that way. So there are three different options how you can connect the on-track with the cloud. What you also see is Modbus TCP. There are, uh, well, let's say several options how you can build your on-track. Standard, the on-track is provided with UE Insights. UE Insights, it's the cloud platform, what you can use to monitor, observe, lubricate bearings or do what's needed. But lots of factories, they have their own SCADA system, uh, PLCs, of course, maintenance programs. There is an option to connect Modbus, Modbus TCP, to extract data and to visualize that in your SCADA system. So you can make your own historical trends if needed, if you want to do that, and maybe visualize it in a control room. So that's absolutely possible. Okay, so we did a pilot, um, I think a year ago now, or a little more than a year ago, and that pilot was running for a full year on several assets. And we did a comparison method uh, with their traditional lubrication program. And what we noticed is during the monitoring of the system, basically on the same bearings, we decreased 30% of grease consumption. And don't look at this number as like, oh, 30% degrees in grease consumption. That's not a lot of money when you look at it, right? No, it's not about the money in this case. It's about the amount of grease which you normally would have put into the bearing. 65% premature bearing failures. So because we were monitoring it continuously, we could see what was going on with the friction level. And when the moment was there, we immediately acted on it, greased the bearing, so it was back to the healthy phase. So you will not have that unplanned downtime. We did the right thing at the right moment. And the most important thing, and that's what you see a lot within factories, they want to optimize lubrication, but they just don't have the time. 95% degrees in manual lubrication tasks because the, the, the maintenance engineer, the reliability engineer, or who is taking the lead in this can open his laptop. He can even have his cup of coffee. He can activate by a simple push on the virtual button to activate the lubricator. He can close the program and could do something else because the system will lubricate the bearing for you. So 95% reduction in hours. So if you look at it on a yearly base, how much money that eventually is, and you can use the guy for different tasks. So the system itself, when installed and uh, managed correctly, you can prevent lots of maintenance time tasks. Okay, so on track with smart lubrication case studies, uh, because we have several customers worldwide, different industries, different things that we encountered. So what I will show here is just, yeah, several cases that we had with the on-track system. Okay, so what you see here, this is a fan bearing. And the nice thing about a fan bearing is it's rotating most of the time with a constant RPM. So that makes it pretty good 
to monitor. What you also can see, uh, the sensor is on there, but there's also a vibration sensor on there. Um, there is an extended grease line. So there are two ways to monitor your lubricator. You can do direct mounting, so the location where the grease nipple is, or you do it a little remote. It means you mount it somewhere at the safe spot, and eventually with an extension tube, you can guide it to the bearing and grease the bearings on that way. So in this case, we knew, because they were already monitoring the vibration, that there was nothing really going on. And this is the spectrum, what you saw from that, or spectrum, let's say, this is the trend, what you saw from that specific bearing. It's a little difficult to see, but you see that the green line, that's the baseline. That's the one we use to trend the bearings. The blue line is the lubrication line. The yellow line is the plus 16 dB, it's the beginning visual faults. And eventually the red line, that's the, well, plus 35, the extreme, wow, extreme, but the pretty severe damaged phase. So here, even though you think that the program says we need to grease the bearing, it's not needed. You're still in a healthy phase. Okay, so this video, it's, um, there's no sound, but this is basically what the principle of the lubrication looks like. You see here, yeah, there is, it's in the blue line, and we just say we want to grease this specific bearing. So you check it, you confirm it, you press one time on the virtual button, and the system will start the process. So the lubricator is being triggered and it will put in grease. Uh, he's changing the scale to make it easier to look at. Normally, of course, you don't have to do that, but it's just to visualize it a little better. And we fast forward it a little because normally what the system does, uh, like when you're used to manual grease, you do like chuk, 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 chuk. The system does lubrication, one cycle, and then it waits a little to check what the friction level is doing. It, it also tracks the amount of grease what it put into the bearing. And if it dropped, but not far enough, it can grease a little more and more and more. And don't think, and maybe you will have that question that, yeah, but Peter, what if the bearing is damaged? Or uh, so we grease it, but the lubrication level is not going down or is going up very quickly. Uh, uh, is the system then still like automatically repeating itself that it over grease the bearing? No, it will not. Because what you can do is that's behind the screens. You don't see it behind the widget. You can fill in what is the max capacity, what this bearing can have on grease. So it will never exceed that number and you will never over grease that bearing. So what you see now is that there are way more blue dots close to each other. And that is when you start lubricating, more data will be sent. So you can see very, very clear what's happening with that specific bearing. So you add grease, you wait. And what you see already is that the grease is going down. And on the left side, you see volume of lubricant here is 0.67 cc. This lubricator was set on uh, 33 cc. And now it's a one cc, that means it did three cycles. So you can see how much grease was put into this bearing and what's the effect. And eventually, it reaches the right amount of grease what's in the bearing and it goes perfectly back to the baseline because it needs time and it goes into the cloud. So you see slowly what the effect is and it will keep an eye on it. And now we're observing it. And I can imagine the first time you grease a bearing, you want to see what the effect is. But eventually when you did it a few times, you just want to be sure and you close UE inside. So you're going to do something else and the system will do it for you. Just Grease the bearings, optimize the friction level, and there you go. So this is all automatically being done. You see uh, smart loop manual, smart loop assist. Smart loop manual means I manually say I want to have one shot, one cycle of grease in the bearing. And smart loop assist is the computer, the platform is doing the thinking for you, the monitoring for you. So it repeats the cycles till it greased enough. That's the two options what you will have. Okay, so here you see a lubricator and you also see a number on there. I hope you can see it, but it says number one. You heard me saying in the, in the movie that 
this lubricator was set on uh, 0.33 cc per cycle. You can program the lubricator in six different menus. Mo uh, number one is 0.33 cc and number six, oh, wait, now I'm going too fast. And number six is two cc per cycle. So you, depending on the size of the, of the bearing, you can set the lubricator term till a certain amount of cc's per cycle. This is direct mounting, and you see the sensor on the back, uh, but you also have the option to, to place the lubricator somewhere else with an extension grease tube and then grease the bearing on that way. I always say what distance is needed if I get the question, well, of course, the closer the better, but we can overcome till a distance of six meters. Okay, so here again, you see it, right? The same as what we saw in the video. It's in the blue area. We need to grease it. We activated it. And you see below that big arrow, you see like a schematic drawing. It says 75.6% grease left in the bearing. Because we know how much you see the lubricator puts into the bearing per cycle. It literally counts the amount of cycles what it did. And that's how it knows how much grease is still left in that lubricator. Here again, direct mounting. And here we notice something. Although it was still on the green line, you see a difference. There is some like peak to peak value. It's, it's, it's pretty, well, I would say rough. And normally when you have a bearing that's going, well, running fine and is lubricated fine, you have more smooth uniform rushing sound. So the situation here was, it needed a little grease. So they did it, they, they did a little lubrication and you saw immediately after they added some grease, the effect of grease in this specific bearing. Okay, another one also with direct mounting, but if correct, I also have a picture where you don't see that. And there's on a non-drive and a drive end, both a lubricator. And this is also very important to understand. Each specific bearing needs a lubricator and a sensor because we need to say which lubricator need to grease what bearing. If you put a T in there, that means it goes to two bearings, then you are going to lubricate both bearings. But what if only one bearing needs grease at that moment? So one bearing, one lubricator, one sensor. Okay, so what you see here is, hey, the needle indicator, it's the blue line. Well, this one was even in the, in the yellow area, very close. And, we grease this bearing because even if it's a higher alarm level, you still need to grease it. Even if you know that the bearing is damaged, you're still going to grease it to prolong, prolong or well, let's say to make the lifetime of the bearing longer so that it will run until planned downtime. Okay, but what happened here is because we were not sure, we greased the bearing and the friction level went down. And normally when it is a grease related issue, the baseline stays longer stable, right? But here you saw immediately that the friction level or immediately the same day went up again. So you could grease the bearing, but that is not the problem. So even though there is no sound file, no spectrum, but just doing logical thinking, you can already see like, hey, from this specific bearing, we greased the bearing, but it went up again. Is this a real critical bearing? Well, maybe we need to ask vibration to do more in-depth analysis to find out what is causing this issue, right? So not one technology is the holy grail regarding PDM. The combination of different technologies is the holy grail because you always have strong points and weak points per technology. Ultrasound is very strong in optimizing lubrication program. Vibration, in-depth analysis. So why not use it together? Okay, so this is the situation. Uh, we tried multiple times to grease the bearing, but every time the sound level went up again. So this is a sign there is something going on in this bearing. We need to do further investigation. Okay, another example, and this is nice. These are redundant. And if they're redundant and you have two assets on there, it doesn't matter if one motor is offline you can still put the sensor on there, the lubricator, the on-track, and you can see when the motor is starting up again. And when it is starting up, when his little brother, eh, the redundant one, is next to it, you can compare the spectrums. And what you see here 
there were two similar motors with a similar pump, similar load. And when it was starting up, well, then it was making a little more sound, but you see the top one starting up and then very stable. And then you saw it was switched off again. But the second one you see during the startup, but it is a complete different way. And it takes way longer for that specific bearing to, well, basically get back to the baseline. And when it was running for a longer time, it starts heating up, it was rising again. So this is already a sign like, hey, they should look similar, but this one looks different. So what's the reason that? And, oh, sorry. And in this case, there was imbalance behind it that was causing that problem. So we did not know what the problem was, but after further investigation, we found that it was imbalance and that was causing this problem. Okay, about RPMs, um, of course, it's an online system. There's very sensitive sensors. And yes, you can use it on, on slow speed, like what we did here, we even greased it, but in my eyes, it's not the perfect application to do. You can, you can do it. But of course, when you have um, um, motors, fans, gearboxes, uh, cooling towers, those are perfect applications for an on track system. Uh, it has a nice RPM, gives enough friction, what we can trend, what we can grease. But for monitoring, slow speed, you see here, 1.8 RPM. As long as it generates friction, there is a possibility to grease and monitor the bearings. So that was a lot of <laughs> information. Uh, also the history of lubrication, uh, the importance of lubrication, and of course the on-track system. Um, once again, uh, I see there are questions popping up in the Q&A. If you have questions, um, well, you see my email, you can send them directly, uh, but you can also put them here in the Q&A. Don't hesitate if you have any questions. And um, after this webinar, when the webinar is closed, I will keep it open for a short time so you have time to put in some, uh, some questions. Then after this webinar, I will personally come back to everybody that has questions. So for now, I would like to thank you for your time. It was uh, almost 40 minutes, so that's not too long, but I hope it was informative and that you know about possibilities from the ultrasonic technology regarding lubrication. So once again, I want to thank you all for listening. Have a nice day. And maybe we talk each other and see each other later. Bye-bye.